Good morning. Hello, Daily Doses. Welcome to Wonder Wednesday with myself, Dr. Chips. I hope you are all well on this beautiful day. What a fantastic day it is. The weather out there is looking incredible. In fact, I cannot see a cloud in the sky in Salford, which is quite unusual, but it's lovely. Um, so yeah, what a great start to the morning. Now, welcome if you're joining us for the first time. Um, if you are a new daily doser, I know we're getting lots of people on a Wednesday tuning into Wonder Wednesdays as part of the Great Science Share. So hello to you. I'm going to do my usual shout outs and registers shortly. If you are a returning Daily Doser, welcome back. I hope you are well. And I hope you enjoyed yesterday's um, session, Computational Thinking Tuesdays. On a Tuesday with Barefoot, we looked at code breaking and we talked about uh, Alan Turing and breaking the Enigma codes. And straight away, I want to say thank you to Alison Robinson and Sammy, who both met, emailed me in here. Oh, God, I went the right way that time. Did you see it? Email about the number of different possible settings for the code for the cipher on the Enigma machine has been 159 quintillion, which is a big number, a huge number. Um, quint is five, so I'm assuming that's million, 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 million. Um, and uh, and that's, that gives you an idea. With our, with our little uh, cipher wheel that we made, we had 25 possible settings. But this had, the Enigma machine had 159 quintillion. So if you didn't watch yesterday's dose, um, go, do go on to the website and go to past doses and, and watch yesterday's one where we talked about how Alan Turing and others at Bletchley Park in the Second World War broke these uh, German codes and also then everyone went and had a go at the barefoot um, digital games, the diamond and code breaking and I'm going to jump onto the showcase blog in just a second to share your work. Uh, but before I do that, um, just say if you are new, please do hit subscribe and like wherever it might be. That means that you will get a message um, when each of these goes live. Also, just to let you know, there won't be Daily Dose next week because next week is half term. So it is time to put away the homeschooling for a week and enjoy your week off. Uh, and then we'll start the week after that. And so that you get kept up to date or your parents get kept up to date on what you need to take part in the Daily Dose. Um, if you go to the website again and get them to put there, go to subscribe, put your email address in, and then each week I send out an email on a Friday saying, this is what I'm doing next week and this is what you need. Okay, so let's now jump on the showcase blog to start the morning. Um, anyone that's new, just to let you know what we do now is we share the work that people have sent in. Any work that gets sent in, I promise I will put it up on the showcase blog. So let's have a look. Just send your email, send your work into this email. Let's now have a look at what is up there from yesterday. Let's jump onto the screen here. And okay. Onto the website. Okay, so just to, to let you know, that's where you need to click subscribe and then you pop your email address in there to get kept up to date. Also, a um, few people didn't realize that you can actually watch all of the previous past doses. So if you're only just joining us, we started this on the 23rd of March, which seems like a very long time ago now. And these are all of the daily doses that we have done so far. And you can click on any of these and you can watch them back. So if you're interested in cybersecurity or making lava lamps, that was a good one. Or super sounds where we made musical instruments out of water and glasses. Or we built our own magnifying glass. Anything you want to go and have a look at, jump on there and have a look. Uh, okay, showcase blog today. First of all, well done to the Welsh boys. Excellent work to you two. You managed to complete the barefoot game and retrieve the diamond that Miss Doctor, correction, Doctor Mischief had stolen. And um, you printed out your own Caesar cipher wheel and were encoding and decoding messages. Excellent. Well done to Nancy as well, who was doing the same. 
and I can see there you've taken your name, you've then encoded it, and importantly, you've said what your cipher wheel was set to, an offset of five, if people then wanted to decode it. So you'd have to make sure that that was uh, not, didn't get into the wrong hands, because then anyone with that wheel could decode it with that offset setting. Excellent, well done to Jess and Harry. Um, who were playing the game. Hey, agent, I love your agent name, Jess007. Fantastic. You played the diamond, you completed the diamond, diamond retrieved, and you had a go at using a cipher wheel to encode some messages. There's your cipher wheel there. Oh, and you had a split pin to hand. Uh, excellent. Um, oh, I'm not sure if that's a split pin there or if we've been a bit creative with what we've used, but well done, super. And Sammy, uh, well done to Sammy. Uh, you created your cipher wheel, encoding some messages. In fact, in fact, everybody, he's left an encoded message there with a cipher setting of 11. Maybe somebody could go onto the showcase blog and decode Sammy's message for us. That would be great. And well done on completing the diamond and you completed code cracking as well. Um, and Isabella as well, let's play a short video. We can see you working away. Are you explaining how this works? I think you are. Let's just go for some sound here. So I'm gonna pull my mic out, it'll be a little bit quiet and then we'll be able to hear you, just one second. Testing, testing. Right, I think I'm back. Um, let's have a look here at you doing this. Let's have a listen. Okay, so you're demonstrating it to us. Now, your mum said that you actually love your code so much you already had one of these cipher wheels, which is what you are using there. So it was an opportunity to get yours out and uh, practice and you're decoding that message there so so far we've got a d and an r and then a c i think i might know what this says let's have a look d r c h is it dr chip could it be let's find out we've got an h next which is an I, yeah, and the final one. Uh, top chip. Uh, super, thank you, and thanks for the su thumbs up at the end there. That is excellent. I was a little bit worried there that you might not have seen the previous showcase blog, just because when I took my, when I did that before, it showed I had two desktops working. So let me just run up again in case you didn't. But we got Sammy's there. We've got Jess and Harry, and uh, we've got Nancy, and we've got the Welsh boys there. So, right, well done to all of those. I'm going to pop my mic back in. It will go quiet for another 30 seconds, then you'll be back to me. So here we go. Can you hear me? Can you? Yes, I'm back. Right. So, well done to all those people. And if you want your work on the Showcase blog, simply send it in to this email. Just don't include the faces of yourselves, your children, in it because we can't show those on YouTube. Next up, we've got the register, morning register time. So these are people that haven't necessarily been able to send anything in but would like a shout out. And first of all, and you just get this again by emailing, email me whatever you want, basically. Uh, first shout out goes to St. Bede's Catholic Junior School in Witness, Cheshire. Hello to all of you from that school that are tuning in as part of the Great Science Share Wonder Wednesday. Hello and welcome. And uh, I think a few of you have been tuning in to the other days as well, which is fantastic. Really appreciate it. Hello to Abdullah and Mustafa. Hope you're both well this morning. Good morning to Lucy, George and Louise, who tuned in for the first time yesterday, tuning in again today. Um, welcome back. Lily and Sophie. Yes, this was a cool one. So Lily and Sophie, I think you're tuning in with Dad today. 
I went to school, secondary school, with mum. Um, and they were saying, they emailed me and said that their great nana worked at Bletchley Park during the war as a typist. How fantastic is that to hear that news? Um, and, and then it says James found out. Now, I think it's James' dad. Uh, I was a little bit unsure, but I think their dad found out about this um, at the same time as grandpa uh, did. So I think what we're saying here, it was so secret, you, the work that happened at Bletchley Park, and people were so secretive about it that actually uh, Lily and Sophie, your dad um, found out about his granddad, your great-granddad, uh, sorry, his uh, Nana, your great Nana, working at Bletchley Park at the same time his granddad did. So she kept it a secret, um, which is what they had to do. It was so, so important. So thank you so much for ch sharing that. Um, really, really interesting. And welcome uh, along again today. And good morning to Dave and George and uh, Nancy and Pring, is it? And also, I'm sure... Uh, Zaina and Nanny Pat, although I haven't written down here, I'm sure I saw your, your email as well. So hello to you. Right, okay. That's all the hellos, the welcomes, the showcasing. Let's get on to today. So Great Science Share Wonder Wednesdays. Each week we've got a theme the Great Science Share has. And each week the team at the Great Science Share, Lynn Bianchi, uh, Helen Spring, um, send me and make for me and for you, some worksheets to support you in doing your Wonder Wednesday session. So let me quickly show you where these sheets are on the Great Science Share website so you can get them, and then we'll start working through one of the activities from today. So let me just show you on here. It's really simple to find. You just go to the website and you go to Home, and then you scroll down, and in Wonder Wednesdays, um, oh, I haven't put it up. How silly of me. I knew I'd forgotten to do something. Right, the moment I finish, the moment I finish, I'm going to put the file here for you to download. In fact, in fact, can I do it live without giving away any information? Uh, about things. Let's find out. Yes, because you don't see my password details or anything like that. So here you go. You can see how I actually work on the on Weebly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the file. We're going to do a file download. And we're going to go upload file, upload file from computer. Engineering challenge, up it goes. And that's hosting on something called a server. And we do publish and do, do, do. there we go, we're back. Okay, there we go, a little bit of extra computing today. Okay, so uh, go to the website, click on download file, that will give you the session for today. And then also do go to the Great Science Share website and register to take part in the Great Science Share. Um, you can, and if you click on Get Involved, you'll see on here the list of weekly themes. Okay, and this week, we've already done International Dawn Chorus Day. We've already done the space theme last week. This week is all about scavenger hunts. So going and finding stuff and looking carefully at the stuff in our environment. Um, so you can go on to here. They've, they've got my lesson on here, but they've got loads of other activities, really cool activities to do as well. And each week they give you a resource to help you with your questioning as well. So you can go on and have a look. Uh, this week it's a question maker um, with a question hand. And I think you write different questions to the different fingers. So that's a really cool one. So that's how to get onto the great, great Science Share and look at their other resources there as well. Okay, now let me come back off of this. Okay, so scavenger hunts this week, finding things. Now normally 
Uh, these scavenger hunts are done outside, but because at the moment we're being encouraged not to roam too far um, and to ma maintain social distancing and stuff, we're, uh, people are doing sort of scavenger hunts inside. But when you do do scavenger hunts outside, it encourages you to look closely at the environment. And this idea inspired us to think about um, something called biomimicry. Okay, uh, biomimicry. Now, I, I always have difficulty saying this. I've been practicing. I think I'm getting it right. Biomimicry. Now, biomimicry is, is fascinating. Okay, and we're going to do a little bit of an activity exploring it. It's all about how engineers who design things actually look at nature for inspiration. All right, now, the easiest way to explain this is to give you an example. So let's go to this one here, and you should see, still see a mini me down here. Yep, okay. So these are called cockle birds. They're a type of plant, and there are different types, um, variations of these. And they, on the top of the plant, they have these little buds. And if you go out walking in an area which have these type of plants, you come back and often you find all of these little burrs, uh, the top bits, stuck on you. You know, you're picking them out of your clothes, little ball-like things. You might have experienced this yourself. Now, one engineer, an inventor, an engineer, um, about 50, oh, no longer than that now, 60, 60 odd years ago, 70-odd uh, years ago, looked at these and had an idea for something that they were going to create, um, a type of sort of fabric that would stick to things in the same way that these cockle birds did. They looked at them, he looked at them very closely, and if you look at these closely up there, you'll see that they have these kind of hooks uh, protruding out of them. Now have a think, does anybody know what that person might have then gone on to invent inspired by nature, by these cocklebirds? Does anyone know? Okay, and just while you think for a second, I'm just going to give you a little hint by a sound that you might hear in the classroom sometimes when people have this on their shoes. Any idea? Yes, it's Velcro. Okay, so here I've got a bit of Velcro. It's on the, the phone holder that I use when I go running. And if you look, if you've got some Velcro in the house and you look very, very closely at it, you will see it works in exactly the same principle. It has these kind of hooks at the end of, um, of it on the one side, which actually then hooks onto the kind of fluffy other side. And it makes that noise when we do it. If you're a teacher and you're teaching key stage one and you've got kids that are sat and you're trying to get them to be quiet and you hear them going with their feet, it can be a, become a very annoying noise. But that's one example of biomimicry. So hopefully getting in a bit of an idea of what we mean, looking at nature and being inspired. Here's another really cool um, example. Oh, sorry, here's the picture of the Velcro. Here's another really, really cool example. On the left, uh, we have the bullet train in Japan, one of the fastest trains in the world. And the nose of that bullet train, was in, the design of that was inspired by the kingfisher's beak. Because the kingfisher's beak is perfectly designed so that it can dive into water, creating a minimal splash, minimal resistance. Uh, we talked about... Um, resistance through air, didn't we, with our rockets? This is very, very similar stuff. Um, so they used the inspiration of the Kingfisher's bill to design the bullet train. Okay, Fantastic example here. And here, it's fascinating stuff, this, because what's happened is in nature, the process of evolution, and we did that lesson on evolution, uh, looking at birds' beaks and how things have adapted over time. That was last week, wasn't it? I lose track. Um, process of evolution in nature has produced these really refined, efficient, and effective designs, and we just pinch them as engineers. It's great. Uh, here's another one. 
and I always manage to get aeroplanes in where I can. Or above me here, we have birds flying. When they need to fly a long distance as a group, they fly in a V formation. And the reason they fly in a V formation is uh, the birds behind the leader, because the way the air comes off of the one at the front, or the ones in front of them, um, if they go behind it and slightly to a side, and you do all of that and they end up with a V, they actually get a little bit of lifting air, which helps them stay up. So they have to flap a little bit less. Okay, so it helps them save energy. And then we just use that now. So when warplanes fly, this is a picture of some uh, war, war aircraft. Let me, what aircraft are they? I think they are uh, hurricanes. Um, if they need to fly a distance, they will <coughs> imitate, mimic, biomimicry. They will do, use the same V formation for exactly the same reason. And we got that idea from nature. Nature is really cool. The process of evolution is really cool. Um, <coughs> Oh, I need a cup of tea a second. Hang on, I'm slurping my tea. There we go. Okay, so um, first activity that I've got for you today on this is if you go back to uh, the website, uh, Dr. Chips, there we go. Uh, I have found a great resource from uh, the World um, WWF, World Wildlife Foundation. Yep, and um, if you download it here, it is a whole load of matching cards, great resource, with other examples of biomimicry. So you can look at, uh, you can match up the thing that happens in nature, the example from nature, and then whatever the engineers have created being inspired by nature. And it's a matching activity. And it shows you loads more of these examples. They're really cool. Well, uh, I'm going to give you, give you one of the answers uh, away now. But I've got to share it with you because I didn't know about this. And it's so cool. But um, on the back of wind turbine blades, they have, on some of the designs, they have these um, kind of, uh, how would you describe it? these sort of vein shapes, um, uh, kind of ridges, and that actually helps it flow through the air better. And they discovered that by looking at the back of humpback whales' fins. The back of humpback whales' fins have the same pattern of ridges, and they looked at how that helps them flow those uh, uh, fins through the water, and then they use that to help turbine blades turn. So yeah, how cool is that? Uh, so that's first activity for you. Second activity is that we are actually going to become biomimicry engineering consultants because there are still things in the world that we do that we could make better by looking at nature. Now, on this slide all around me, uh, I have pictures of pipes. Pipes carrying water in homes and in factories. And if you look at these pipes, tell me what you notice about the angles that these pipes often turn through. So if you, you might or might not have covered this, depending on your age in maths, but just even if you don't know the technical name for these angles, you can still describe them or show. How does the pipe track ch uh, change direction okay uh, oh i can hear a few of you saying right angles and you would be right okay yeah a lot of pipes pipe work actually flows when it changes direction it goes to a right angle like that 90 degrees okay uh, and uh, it might turn like that and then like that and then like that and it goes through right angles but and this is a big but. Scientists are now actually, and engineers, sorry, are looking at nature and looking at how nature transports water and seeing if there is a better way of doing this through biomimicry. And what we're going to do today is your second activity is we are going to do some careful, close observational drawings of a little bit of nature to see whether or not we can make any suggestions for how we could improve these pipes. Now, um, 
I am going to do, 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 walk off screen for just one second because right there is the door to my garden and in my garden there are a few examples of some of the best uh, water distribution systems in the world. Okay, and I'm going to go and get them. I'm only going to be about five seconds uh, because my garden's not massive, but I will be back and then I will show you what bit of nature from my garden we are going to look at to see if we can improve these water distribution systems. Here I go, I'll be back in five seconds. Okay, I'm back. Oh, it is really lovely out there. And here we have them. Let's go to this one here. Here I have them. They are leaves. Okay, now hopefully today you can all get access to some leaves. But please, before you go picking the leaves off your parents' favourite orchid, speak to your parents to make sure if you've got a small garden you can go and get a leaf you might have house plants you don't have to pull the leaves off for this activity um i've just done that because i do bring it in out the garden but you can go to where the leaf is okay um but these leaves are some of the best examples oh i've got a little green fly on there as well um of water distribution networks just like pipes distribute water leaves distribute water they have to distribute water through the veins in the leaf and what i mean by veins is i'm going to try and get this now to get as close as possible to this so let's go really close yes okay hopefully that's still focusing for you there we go so what we're going to do is we're going to do a really close, careful, observational, scientific drawing of a leaf. And we are going to concentrate on looking at the veins. So the veins are, normally you can see them better on the back side of the leaf. Okay. And we've got a big, large vein that runs down through the middle. And you can see all of the smaller veins. I hope you can see this okay. I am going to make that bigger and me smaller because you need less of me and more leaf. Yeah, there we go. Now, it might be a little bit blurred, but this is just me demonstrating it for you to go away and then do this yourself. Now, engineers are actually doing this at the moment. What they've discovered is that anywhere in nature where things have to be distributed, we call it like a branching structure, they all follow the same rules. It's called uh, Murray's law. Even our lungs inside the human body, where it branches into different, uh, you've got ventricles and then further down into uh, alveoli eventually isn't it yeah they all branch in the same way um, and they're just they're in the process of looking very carefully to see can we learn anything about the way leaves distribute their water throughout the plant to help us improve the way we do it with pipes and I'll give you one hint that that 90 degree angle that we saw in all of those pipes actually in nature, we don't see it very much at all. So what I want you to do today as a second task is have a go at doing a really careful drawing of a leaf and its vein structure. Now, I am using pen because I want you to be able to see it on film, but I want you to use a pencil nice sharp pencil and I want you to take your time this is an important skill looking is an important skill of a scientist because sometimes we think we're looking carefully but we're not we're just making up what we think is there but actually I want you in your drawing to very carefully 
draw what you see. Now, even when I start to draw this first part of the leaf, move it across a bit, can you see that actually this leaf, it doesn't have any 90 degrees at all. So why are we using 90 degrees if nature isn't? Okay, that's a really important question that engineers are now starting to ask themselves. If, well, why doesn't nature use 90 degrees? Does nine, is 90 degrees, when we turn things just like that, does that affect things? Is there more friction, perhaps, with that kind of turn? So, please have a go at doing a really careful, close, observational drawing of a leaf as your second task. And look carefully at these veins about how that water is distributed through the leaf. And let me, uh, and tell me what you notice, okay? Do you have any right angles in yours, yes or no? And if you were then going to change the way that you uh, piped water through a house, how might you change it, okay? Would you still have 90 degrees or would you do it slightly differently? Now, the interesting thing with this is sometimes there might be the best way to do it from nature, but manufacturing, the way we make things, might make that difficult. So is it easier to build things with 90 degrees than it is to build things that sort of snake through buildings? So a lot of what we call design compromises. But uh, really lovely exercise this. Get some calming music on. Take your time. Look really carefully. Uh, notice the patterns that you can see and try and draw them as best you can. So that's activity number two. Well, there are lots of activities today. So on the sheet as well that you can download, there are two further activities um, which you can do as well. If you get the opportunity, not everyone might be able to do this one. Um, so these are kind of optional extras. You can go outside and explore habitat. So remember, we've got to maintain the social distancing rules, etc. So as part of your daily exercise, you can go for a walk and look at habitats. So that might be in your garden or in a local area, or you can still look at habitats in your house. You can actually go on a spider safari and see if there's anywhere in your house where you can find spiders living and looking at their habitats. And then, then you can have a go at an engineering challenge, which is why I mentioned that you might want to get some craft materials and actually have a go at building a habitat for um, a, an insect, what have we got here? Dr can you design a habitat for an insect or animal using craft materials? And maybe you could even think about how your design could be influenced by biomimicry. Wow, that's a real challenge one. Okay, so lots of different activities for you today. Have a go at the matching cards, then have a look, close look at the leaves from your gun to see how we could perhaps improve on how pipes work with practicing your skills of careful uh, scientific uh, drawings. And send them in to me. Uh, send them in at this email address and I will get them on the blog. I'm really looking forward to seeing these because whenever I do this kind of activity with pupils in my class, I'm always amazed at how they concentrate, they really focus and concentrate and produce some excellent detailed diagrams. Um, so there we go. Right, last couple of things from me. Oh yes, one thing to say is actually on, on a Wednesday, not only can you send in your work to me, but also if you go to the Great Science Share website, you can submit your drawings and have pictures of anything else that you do to the Great Science Share. And they will again, they will also include it in what they're doing. So if you go share your science, um, and here you go, you can upload uh, pictures of your science, you can tweet them with the um, Great Science Share hashtag and science from home. Um, or you can post a message on Facebook as well or email them, okay? But I think the best option is to upload it there as well. So do share 
to the site, uh, uh, to the great science share, as well as to me. Right, finally then, before I finish, uh, the riddle. Okay, well, I didn't tell you at the beginning what the riddle was, but the riddle was from yesterday. I'm tall when I'm young and I'm short when I'm old. What am I? Hmm, I'm tall when I'm young and I'm short when I'm old. What am I? Well, these people got it straight away and emailed me in. There's two, there's actually two answers I'm going to accept for this one. Uh, these people got it. Lucy, George and Louise, Dave and George, Miss Parks, uh, Bertie, Sammy, Nancy and Shane. You all said either it can be a candle or a pencil because with both of those, when they are uh, young, they are, and you first start using them, they are tall, and then the more you use them, the older they get, they get shorter. What I didn't realise as well is how many people are going to comment on the fact that I've got wonky candles in the background. Um, a few people... Uh, included in their emails that the candle could be wonky or straight or words to the similar effect. So I'm sorry that it's been troubling so many people that these are a bit wonky. The hole in the candle holder is slightly bigger than the candle. In fact, maybe we could do a little bit of a engineering fix on these. Let's get a little bit of paper here and see if we can get them to stand up straight by wedging it in like... So, uh, is it straight? Yay, there we go. Okay, candles fixed. Um, and so, finally then, riddle for tomorrow. You've got to listen carefully on this one because it's a bit of a trick one. There's a one-story house where everything is yellow. The walls are yellow. The doors are yellow. Even all the furniture is yellow. The house has yellow beds, yellow couches, yellow chairs. What colour are the stairs? I'll say that one more time, okay? There's a one-storey house where everything is yellow. The walls are yellow. The doors are yellow. Even all the furniture is yellow. The house has yellow beds and yellow couches and yellow chairs what color are the stairs if you think you know the answer uh email me let me know please also send in your work from today for the showcase blog for tomorrow tomorrow tinker like it's thursday we are making the world's best paper airplane the paper airplane that we are going to build tomorrow holds the world record for the longest distance ever flown by a paper airplane set back in 2012, never beaten. Maybe one of you daily doses might beat it. Fingers crossed. Um, and we're also going to be doing a couple of little experiments to explain a little bit how about how airplanes fly using the paper uh, that we've got before we turn it into our paper airplane. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Have a fantastic day um, in the lovely weather and I will see you at the same time tomorrow, 10 o'clock for Thursday's Daily Dose. Bye for now.